Let's talk about self-storage due diligence time periods. So far, we talked about in this series on self-storage due diligence, what to get from the seller and how to create a due diligence timeline. And last week, we talked about the physical inspection and how to work with third-party vendors. Today, let's talk about the financial and, and books and records inspection and operational inspections. My name is Mark Helm. I'm the author of Creating Wealth Through Self Storage and I'm the creator of the Self Storage Quick Start Academy. And what I do is I support the small investor who wants to get in the self storage business or who wants to grow their self storage business strategically do so in a way that creates true wealth and a fulfilling career. You can find out more about how I support the small investor at creatingwealththroughselfstorage.com. Go to the store there and you'll see the self storage quick start on demand boot camp, which takes some of what we're doing. One of the four phase strategies is due diligence and it goes into a lot of detail in that training about how to go through a due diligence period, the forms we use and so forth. You can find out more creating wealth through selfstorage.com. But let's talk about at least what we do and when we're analyzing a storage facility we have under contract and we're in the due diligence period. Remember in the first episode all that stuff we got from the seller? Remember that? What in the world do you do with all that? Even if this is your first self storage facility you're purchasing, realize that you're going to run your business and you're going to run your facility a lot different than the current owner does. Yes, a lot of the expenses may be the same or close to the same, but our job during this time period is to flush out what are the expenses really going to be for us depending on how we're going to run our storage facility remember ultimately when you're buying a storage facility what you're buying are cash flows yes you're buying real estate but in technical terms what you're doing is you're spending capital dollars to buy improvements that generate operating income. And during this due diligence period, my relationship to it is, I want to flush out and project what the operating income is really going to be for me, and then compare that to what my uh, preliminary performa was, and see if after I've gathered all the information I can gather, if this particular facility meets my long-term and short-term investment goals. If it does, then we pull the trigger and close on it. If it doesn't, we either walk away or try to get it at a rate that does. It's that simple. That's how I relate to the due diligence period. So one of the first things that we do is we flush out what some of the easier numbers are to get. Insurance. I look at the seller's current insurance policy. I send that to an, our current insurance agent. I also send it to a couple of other vendors, national vendors from the Self Storage Association or Inside Self Storage. and send them the policy and usually we're our insurance goes up a little bit because we make sure we have riders that not every seller has the riders that we are very interested in having are one wrongful disposition insurance that's covering you in the event that there's a you do an auction wrong that's the number one liability exposure a storage owner has is wrongful disposition so we get an insurance writer to cover that we also make sure we get an insurance an environmental cleanup insurance writer that will clean up the 25 thousand dollars per incident so if somebody puts some glowing material in 55 gallon containers and leaves it in a unit i've got insurance to help me clean that up we've never had to use it but i make sure we have it 
Sometimes we get other riders depending on what part of the country we're in, whether we're around coast or not, might affect the type of insurance that we have. But we make sure we get apples to apples bids on our insurance numbers and we usually start that process fairly early with a copy of the insurance policy from the seller. Next, we look at the taxes. We look at the seller's tax bill. It's pretty easy to calculate based on the mill rate, what we think our taxes will be. Sometimes we even engage a tax consultant that will help us reduce it once we get the original assessment that's coming in. But we put that tax number in. That's a pretty easy number to determine once you have a tax bill. Then utilities. We'll plot the utilities out over the last few years, look at the last 12 months utility bills, and we can pretty well determine what our utility bill is going to be, project that into the future. Then if we're doing a adding space, depending on what type of space we're adding, we may up that utility number, but that's a pretty easy number to get. So we get the easy numbers first, insert them into our performa. Usually our performa numbers don't change a whole lot on these numbers, but we put that in there. Then we go through the seller's profit and loss statements with a fine tooth comb, line by line. What expenses do they have that we're not going to have, like automobile expenses? Very often people are running automobiles through their business, certain service contracts. Very often we've seen sellers will pay themselves through excess management fees that we're not going to have. Um, and we take line by line their expense. What expenses are they paying that we're going to have? Which ones are, will, will you not have? Trash, for example. Are we going to use the municipal trash system if they have one, or are we going to have a dumpster? If we're going to have a dumpster, is it the same size that the seller is going to have? How often is the pickup? We'll read their service contract, see how hard it is to get in and out of it, and maybe get some bids on that. Employees. Now, I could do a whole episode on employees. We're not going to here. We go into detail in the boot camp, but how are you going to run that facility? Is you going to have more employees? You're going to have less. Are you going to pay the same rate? What skill sets are you looking for? We always interview the managers that are there if we're going to keep managers, but we don't always keep the people who are there, but we'll interview them. And we lean on those current managers during the due diligence process quite a bit. Very often, though, how they've been running the facility and their way of doing, of managing a facility is going to be very different than what we're looking for. We've had some switch over to our culture and do well and thrive. Many haven't. So we look very closely at that current employee. Are we going to add more employees or cut employees? Usually we're scaling back a little bit. Uh, we know what our productivity is. I can look at the income of facilities generating and know how many employees we're going to need based on the income on how we run a facility. You may be automating a facility, so you'll be totally replacing a manager with another type of employee. Look at that and adjust the numbers on your performa to reflect what your strategy is going to be. We're also at this time getting bids on any capital improvements we're going to make. We have, if you know, in the Storage World Analyzer, there's a line on the third page as you're putting in sale price, initial facility upgrades? Am I replacing the doors? Am I doing paving? Am I getting fences? Am I getting a new entry system, new gate system? During this time we're getting bids on all of that while we're doing our uh, expense, financial expense due diligence. Now for expansions and conversions, we're going to cover that next week. Here I'm talking about just initial fix up on the facility. There are capital expenses. Like I said, we're getting the insurance bids at this time and we're also going through every service contract that owner has to determine are we going to keep it, are we going to get rid of it, or are we going to replace it.
and then we're adjusting our performa accordingly. We also forward to our attorney any title work, surveys, anything we get from the seller on this and make sure that they're running preliminary and then title, see if there's any issues there. And let's talk about operational reviews now. We've been primarily focused on the expense column, which is real important because my relationship to these performers is, this is my budget. So I'm going to do a 10-year projection and year three in my performa for all practical purposes is our budget in year three. Yeah, we may change some of the line items once we get operating, but for the most part, I relate to that like those are my budget. So I spend a lot of time on this performa during this due diligence period. But at this point, we start looking at how the current seller runs his business and what are we going to do different and how what is what we're going to do different going to impact the income. Usually we start with what I'll call the management summary reports. So I'll plot out what his physical occupancy has been year before, year two years ago, year ago and month by month. And I'm looking for trends in occupancy and then I plot next to it what his economic occupancy is going to be, has been. And look, compare the two and look for trends. So in other words, physical occupancy, we might have 88, 90% of the square space of the square footage leased. But if you look at the income coming in after concessions and bad debt, we may be at 70%. So there's an 18% gap between economic and physical. Why? Well, we determine that in the due diligence period. Is there a fundamental issue? In other words, is there a problem with the submarket, like too much self-storage? My feasibility report or my market reports going to shed some light on that. Or is it a function of how they're managing it, not doing poor collections, letting tenants stay who owe money, doing payment plans, all of those begin to affect and spread that gap between physical and economic occupancy. We found one facility where we had an out-of-town owner and the manager would basically pay, I mean the owner would basically pay the manager a bonus for every move-in. Now they were not paying very close attention to what the rental rate was on that move-in, so that manager was incentivized just to move somebody in. And he knew that his what the rental rate was was not going to be looked at very closely. So we saw all kinds of rent structures just to get the move in so he could get the bonus and what that ultimately did was create a pretty big gap between physical occupancy and economic occupancy. We look for that because we're going to develop two weeks from now we're going to talk about how to develop our takeover strategy and usually that takeover strategy requires closing that gap. Every now and then you'll see economic occupancy higher than physical occupancy. That means it's a well-run facility. That means they're good on collections. They're not keeping non-paying customers there very long. And they're able to get income on a unit sometimes twice in a month if somebody moves out. And they're very good at other fees that they're getting. So every now and then we see economic occupancy higher than physical. Most of the time, however, in the mom and pop world, it's the other way around. At some point, very often it's while the physical inspection is happening, I or a member of our team will go on site and we go through every single file. And what you want to do is, you really don't want to overstep this, you want to do this every time. You want to go through every single file. First you want to print off a rent roll for that day from the operating system. Then you want to compare the lead first you compare the unit numbers the unit number the same in the file and on the lease as it is in the computer on the rent roll is the name the same it are the leases all signed by both parties seller and customer and does the rent match up and then we also look and make sure there's no 
credit card information in the folder or written on the folder. You can get a lot of trouble for that. So why is that important? Well, because again, wrongful disposition is the self storage owner's number one liability exposure. And if you don't have a fully executed lease, if anything's different on the lease and signed, if the address isn't correct, there's all kinds of ways that somebody can come back on an owner for an auction. And we start here. Now, I don't care how well run a facility it is, you will find some things that need to be cleaned up. Just get them cleaned up prior to taking over. Don't make a big deal of it. Just get it done. Get the leases signed. Very often the owners, you'll just have the tenant signatures and there'll be 10 leases that this owner needs to sign, stuff like that. Very often we've, re, we've seen where they've renumbered doors but didn't change it on the leases. We've seen addresses that are wrong. Just get all that stuff cleaned up prior to taking over. Next thing we do is we take a random month's bank statements and then we go through the daily closes for that month and we try to match up the daily close with a deposit and then we and then ultimately we look on the P&L and make sure that all that matches or is very close to the same. Sometimes sellers don't close out every day. Sometimes sellers let cash and checks build up, then they make one deposit. You don't want to be running your business that way. You want to have somebody, a third party, be able five years from now to resurrect a day, see the daily close, match it to a deposit, match it to an entry in QuickBooks. That's the right way to run a self-storage business. You're just trying to see if what's reported on the P&L is, is accurate by going through the daily deposit and business activity with the bank statement. If you do a month or two that way, there's no need to do every month. We just want to make sure that one or two months jive for us. We know we can trust pretty much what's on the P&L. Next, we look at the other income sources, tenant insurance. We look at, are we, if, do they have tenant insurance? But we know who our tenant insurance provider is, and we look at getting all of that in place, comparing our tenant insurance to what the seller may have, and getting ready to institute our tenant insurance program. Very often, we're upgrading the retail, creating new retail display, putting pegboard on the wall, ordering in the product because we're going to be pushing on retail sales if there's a manager in there and very often we're getting ready to put truck rental in service then we look very closely at the owner's accounts receivable how many late tenants are there what's how long have they been late there's usually a report you can print off and at some point we don't necessarily do it that day but i'm going to go through or somebody on our team is going to go through customer by customer and get the history on it what you don't want to do and what we see all the time are payment plans you're better off letting that customer take their stuff and go owing you money than you are putting them on a payment plan. If they can't pay their rent, putting them on a payment plan just extends out in slow motion them not being able to pay their rent and they get further and further in debt and then your gap between economic occupancy and physical occupancy just grows. I can look at a daily close a random daily close just look at that one sheet and I can tell you if you have payment plans it is a weak poor way to run a business do not do it develop a strategy for what you're gonna do the day you take over on those accounts receivable if there's payment plans in place the day they miss and they will miss that payment plan is voided and you start the auction process. You're doing yourself a disservice and you're not doing a service to the tenant. If you don't want to auction their stuff, let them take it and go. Put that unit back into circulation. Don't hang on hoping you're going to get some money. 
in general, that's how we do the operations and records analysis of the facility. It's a very, very, very important part of the due diligence process. Don't rush through it. At the end of the pro, you know, we're constantly making adjustments to the performa. The, the art is not to react every time the numbers go up or the numbers go down. Wait till the end, then just look at it as unemotionally as possible and say, does this deal now, with all the information I've got, I might not have all the information I need, but this is all the information I have, does this deal look like a deal that meets our investment goals. Now for me, the hardest part of the whole process is, yes it does. Now for the majority of, of you all, because of the work that you've done in your preliminary analysis, by the time you get to this point, the vast majority that you've put under contract will work. Some of them you've got to walk away from, we have too, but most of the time they work. They meet our minimum investment criteria. That's when I'm the most nervous in the whole process because now I've got to pull the trigger and it's all on me or all on our team. So we've covered that in other episodes. That's a skill and a muscle to be developed. But to get to that point, Go, you've got to go through the due diligence process. That's a quick overview of how we handle the due diligence process. I hope this serves you if you're in there now or soon to be in there. And that's how we do it in today's world. So thank you very much. Next week, we're going to talk about, well, we're going to layer on expansions and conversions onto this due diligence process. I look forward to being with you then. My name's Mark Helm. I'm the author of Creating Wealth Through self Storage. I'll see you later.